name is Patricia Harris. I am a member of the Arms, the excuse me, American Bar Association Standing Committee on Armed Forces Law. We're thrilled to be presenting a timely webinar entitled Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in the Military, Racial Disparity in the Services. This is sponsored by the American Bar Association Standing Committee on Armed Forces Law and the ABA Section of Civil Rights and Social Justice. This panel is the second of a two-part series on diversity, equity, and inclusion in the military. We had the first series last week um, this time. We are actively planning additional programming on a variety of issues. So please visit AmericanBar.org slash CRSJ for updates on these programs. During today's program, we encourage you to ask questions of our panelists through the Q&A, not the chat function. If you look down at the bottom of your screen, um, you will see the chat uh, button and then there's a Q&A button. Please make sure you put your questions in the Q&A section. We will address your qu questions throughout the program. We will also be sharing a recording. Sorry. We will also be sharing a recording for this for anyone who has registered um, so that you can share it widely with your networks. And with that, we bring you today's program entitled Diversity, equity and inclusion in the military, racial disparity in the services. So why are we here today? This panel will provide edu an educational discussion of racial disparities in the military justice system and its impact. Not surprising, but unfortunately, you will hear information today that highlights the fact that our military and veterans are still dealing with issues in diversity, equity, and inclusion in the 21st century. We want to help provide information that will assist you in being an informed part of the conversation. By listening, we learn. By learning, we change. That is a quote from one of our panel members in his article, One Tribe Requires Inclusion, Colonel Christopher Shaw, who you will meet soon. He is quoting the Marine Corps Commandant. We want to help our services make permanent changes that impact generations to come so that our children and their children live in a country that promotes equal justice for all. So now I'm going to introduce our panel. First, we have Colonel Retired Will Gunn. Colonel Gunn has recently been named as the General Counsel and Vice President for Legal Affairs for the Legal Services Corporation. The LSC is an independent nonprofit established by Congress to provide financial support for civil legal aid to low income Americans. In 2009, he was appointed by President Barack Obama as the general counsel for the United States Department of Veterans Affairs. And as a lawyer in private practice, he has assisted military members facing adverse actions. In 1980, he graduated from the U.S. Air Force Academy with military honors. And in 1986, he graduated cum laude from Harvard Law School, where he served as the president of the Harvard Legal Aid Bureau. Colonel Gunn also holds an LLM in environmental law from George Washington University, a master's in national research strategy from the National Defense University, and a master's in ministry with a focus on leadership from Lancaster Bible College. In 2002, he was promoted to Colonel, and in 2003, he was selected as the first ever Chief Defense Counsel for the DOD Office of Military Commissions. In that role, he established an office that defends detainees brought before military commissions at the Guantanamo Prison Camp. He is a former White House fellow, and after retiring from the Air Force in 2005, he served as the CEO of the Boys and Girls Club of Greater Washington, D.C. Colonel Gunn chairs the ABA's 2021 National Law Day commemoration and has chaired the ABA, ABA Commission on Racial and Ethnic Diversity. A longtime student of African-American military history, Colonel Gunn has served as a researcher and member of the Military Advisor 
advisory committee of the History Makers, the nation's foremost repository of African-American audiovisual history. He has served on several boards, is a deacon in his church, and has, served, has received numerous awards. He is married to Dawn, and they have three adult children and four grandchildren. And yes, I read a whole lot, but I wanted you to get an uh, understanding of who we have on our panel. Next, we have Professor Rachel E. Van Landingham. She is the president of the National Institute for Military Justice and a professor of law at Southwestern Law School in Los Angeles, where she teaches criminal law, criminal procedure, and national security law. She testified earlier this year at an Army Administration's Administrative excuse me, Separation Board as an expert regarding racial disparities in military justice. She is currently researching the application of critical legal theory to the military justice system. She graduated from the U.S. Air Force Academy in 1992 and later earned her Juris Doctorate through the Funded Legal Education Program. Professor Van Landingham is the co-author of a casebook on military justice used at Yale Law School. She has published law review articles on military justice issues such as unlawful command influence and the criminalization of speech in the UCMJ. She is currently co-authoring a criminal case law case book. She is also the lead author of numerous, um, numerous amicus curie briefs regarding military justice issues. And our third panelist, Colonel Christopher B. Shaw, serves as the staff judge advocate for training and education and Marine Corps Combat Development Command. As the senior legal advisor on Marine Corps Base Quantico, Colonel Shaw supervises a team of 11 military lawyers. Together, they provide legal and ethical advice to two, to two three-star commanding generals, seven, seven general officers, and their staff and subordinate units. Colonel Shaw was commissioned as a Marine officer and obtained the infantry officer designation. After a tour in the infantry, the Marine Corps selected Colonel Shaw to obtain a law degree at Boston College Law School. As a lawyer, Colonel Shaw served in Iraq as a prosecutor and legal advisor to several general officers. In 2013, the Secretary of the Navy selected Colonel Shaw to serve as his special assistant for legal and legislative matters, where he worked at the Pentagon and provided legal and ethical advice directly to the Secretary of the Navy. In addition to his duties as legal advisor, Colonel Shaw mentors hundreds of officers, including those who, un, who those from underrepresented backgrounds. One on career goals and military service, excuse me, gives leadership lecture to midshipmen at the U.S. Naval Academy and served as the Quantico chapter president of the National Naval Officers Association whose mission supports the recruitment, development, and retention of a diverse officer corps. Um, and as I read through these, you'll see as, we, as the presentations come that they are the right people to be on this panel. Colonel Shaw participates in top level working groups, providing counseling to senior Marine Corps leaders on issues related to diversity, equity, and inclusion. He led a group of colonels who developed the framework adopted by the Marine Corps to create its DOD directed strategic plan on diversity, equity, and inclusion. In the summer of 2020, the Marine Corps Gazette published Colonel Shaw's article, One Tribe Requires Inclusion, which I hope we will hear more about. This article discussed diversity in the Marine Corps and the need for inclusive initiatives to harness the full diverse talents found in the Marine Corps to make them more effective. And that was a lot. But again, if you've got questions in the military justice arena, we have the best um, members on this panel to help, help us to, to navigate through those. So we're gonna start with our first question. And this is for all three of the panel members, they will all get to present on this question. What can you share to educate our audience about the existence of disparity in the administration of military justice in the armed forces from a past present or future perspective. And we're gonna start with Colonel Retired Will Gunn. Thanks very much, Colonel Harris, Pat. 
I appreciate the opportunity to be here today and to uh, share, share with all of you. This is a topic that is near and dear to my heart. I uh, actually, it takes me back more than 30 years because when I was in law school back in 1985, I actually did my third year re uh, research paper on the history of racial policies in the military dating back to, the to 1940. And so since that time, as time permitted and opportunities uh, came about, I devoted time and research into issues that we're dealing with here today. In terms of, so what I'd like to do is just share some thoughts from a historical perspective. And in order to do that, I think it's important for everyone to understand that African-Americans or uh, Black folks on the North American continent have always, since the, their, their coming here in the 1600s, have always played a part in the defense of this nation, in this nation's military. And, and to be clear, uh, when, when I say that, it's important to keep in mind that there were times during the slavery era that uh, they fought with what is now the United States, and there were also times that they fought against the United States. No time is that uh, more accurate than in the revolutionary period, where the British saw a, an advantage in offering the prospects of freedom to uh, enslave the Blacks and in exchange for their coming to fight on behalf of, of the British. And, uh, and because of concerns, there were colonists who were concerned about arming their slaves. But eventually they, they got past that. There were both uh, enslaved Blacks as well as free Blacks that served uh, during the re revolution, some for the British and also some for the for the colonists. But when you look at this issue of ra uh, racial disparities, uh, past, present, future, I think it's important to keep in mind that not only have Blacks always served, but in, in doing my research, I, I came across a saying that essentially says that the military is the most integrated and the greatest bastion of equal opportunity in, in the nation. Uh, and I think that there is a lot of truth in that, but you have to take that statement on the one side along with another statement. And that other statement is that the military is a microcosm of society. So the issues that we confront in the greater society, we also confront in the military. Let me give you a case in point, also looking back. When President Lincoln allowed enslaved Blacks to, uh, for formerly enslaved Blacks, to serve with the Union forces during the Civil War, he actually created a separate military body. Blacks were not integrated into the Union forces. Instead, an entity known as the United States Colored Troops was created, USCT. And Blacks during that period, during the Civil War, fought on behalf of the Union. But in this separate entity, the USCT, in which Blacks served in enlisted roles primarily, but whites were there as part of the United States Colored Troops in command positions. So it's important to keep that in mind. Black leaders such as Frederick Douglass saw the opportunity to serve in the military as an opportunity for Blacks to win their freedom and to demonstrate that they were, that they were fit and able to have all the rights of full citizenship in, in, this, in this nation. And so, even though a great many Blacks served during the Civil War. When the war ended, the United States Colored Troops was greatly uh, 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 limited in size and scope. 
And the Blacks that served during that era, immediately following the Civil War, actually up until and through World War I, they were known as Buffalo Soldiers. And some people say that that terminology comes from a term that was given by Native Americans because uh, the texture of the hair that they, they said reminded them of buffaloes, but also the, the valor displayed, the courage, the bravery displayed by the black serving in, in uniform. And it's also interesting, and, and one needs to keep in mind that primarily the role of the Buffalo soldiers was to use, was one of trying to keep the Native Americans at bay and actually to corral them onto reservations. And so that's a significant part of the history. During the period immediately preceding World War I and the period of World War I, there was a lot of backlash against Blacks who were uh, being brought back East and who were in, in positions uh, to, uh, of being trained in preparation for war. And there are two incidents that I would bring to your attention. One occurred in 1906 in Brownsville, Texas. Uh, and in that incident, 167 black soldiers were administratively discharged following an uprising in the town of Brownsville, Texas, where uh, blacks were being, black soldiers were being mistreated and they, they, res they responded. Some uh, uh, white uh, citizens, civilians were, were injured and no one was coming forward with information on what actually happened. So the United States Army responded by having mass discharge proceedings and discharging 167 uh, black soldiers. They received no pension. They all received bad, uh, bad discharges and they were not allowed any further service. And this was done, the, the army secretary at the time said that he was alluding to a precedent that had been established by Robert E. Lee in the period preceding uh, the civil war in which Lee supposedly had uh, discharged a company of, of men when he couldn't uh, find out who had committed a, a given act. There were widespread protests uh, with respect to this. Booker T. Washington, who was known by some as an accommodationist uh, and uh, a friend, if you will, of president, uh, of, uh, of, of presidents and such, he, pr he protested and it was to no avail. It took until 1972 for the records of these individuals to be corrected. In 1917, there was another uh, incident, and this one also in Texas at a place called Camp Logan near Houston. And in that incident, uh, following police beatings, there was a revolt by black soldiers who were being mistreated on, on, on the base. In that revolt, 15 whites were, were killed. There was a mass court martial of uh, two mass court martials, one involving over 63 people, more than 54 were convicted of murder as well as mutiny in time of war. And several of these individuals, I believe 15, were uh, actually hung before the case was ever reviewed. This brought about changes in the military justice system, the precursor to the system that we have today that would not have allowed for, for such things. So in that period after World War I, I'll just fast forward and say that uh, black activists, many black citizens pushed for integration of the military. And the, there was a frequent outcry that the, that the military was not a place for social experimentation, that integration might uh, harm good morale and discipline in, in the service. And so there was great resistance 
and because we do have, uh, I know Colonel Shaw has has some remarks, and we have a uh, two two Air Force folk and a uh, and Marine. I, I'll, I'll tell you, Colonel Shaw, and I'll tell others that I was struck by some language that I found from the Commandant of the Marine Corps in the period leading up to uh, World War II, talking about the prospects of integration. Then Commandant of the Marine Corps, General Thomas Holcomb, uh, was really resistant to the idea of Black serving in the Marines. And he stated that there would be a definite loss of efficiency in the Marine Corps if we have to take Negroes. He went on to make his antipathy for Black serving in the Marines clear when he stated, if it were a question of having a Marine Corps of 5,000 whites or 250,000 Negroes, I would rather have the whites. That was the commandant of the United States Marine Corps. Nevertheless, bound to political pressure in the aftermath of the uh, of World War II, President Truman issued Executive Order 9981, which ended official segregation of the armed forces. And as a result of World War, uh, not World War, but the Korean conflict, we had the integration of the services over time. And by about 1954, all formerly all black units had been dissolved and Blacks have been integrated into other services. Despite integration, that did not mean that everything was okay and that everything was at peace in terms of race relations in the military. A time that's really poignant from my, my life, as a child growing up during the Vietnam era, I saw that uh, I heard stories about Blacks protesting on military installations places such as Travis Air Force Base and the USS Kitty Hawk aircraft carrier. And what the, what the protests involved were largely dissatisfaction over the military justice system and how it was being meted out in practical terms with respect to black, uh, black soldiers, Marines and sailors. So, this is an issue that is that has gone on. I would invite your reading, and perhaps we'll talk about it some more. In 1972, there was a Department of Defense task force on uh, the military justice system, and it looked at racial disparities in the military. And that report was light on data in terms of the extent of the actual disparities, but what it was heavy on was the belief on the part of black airmen, sailors, soldiers, and Marines, that they were being mistreated, that the system was unfair, that they received a disproportionate amount of punishment as a result of the military justice system. As I looked at that report, it really came to mind just recently, uh, less than a year ago, when the US Air Force, where I served, issued a report on racial disparities, looking particularly at the experience of African-Americans in the Air Force. What that report found was that black airmen are 72% more likely than white enlisted members to receive non-judicial punishment. Black airmen are 52% more likely than white enlisted members to face court martial and black airmen are nearly twice as likely as white enlisted members to be administratively discharged for misconduct. There are a lot of issues there and we can, we can unpack those perhaps uh, as this session goes on, but I wanted to share those thoughts. Yes, the military has been a bastion for equal opportunity on the one hand and on the other hand, it is definitely a microcosm of the greater society. I yield my time. Thank you, Colonel Gunn. That was that was amazing. Uh, yes, I, I won't comment now. I do have another follow up question in a minute. I'm going to go to Professor Van Landingham and ask her to give her thoughts on 
what she can share to educate our audience about the existence of disparity in the administration of military justice in the armed forces from a past, present, or future perspective. Thank you so much, Patricia, and thank you, uh, Colonel Gunn and Colonel Shaw, uh, uh, for the opportunity to join you today. Um, this uh, has deep personal and professional meaning for me. Uh, a first question, Patricia, can you see my slides? Y yes, I can. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. I always ask my students that because <laughs> you never know with Zoom. So good morning from a sunny Los Angeles. I know most, of, most folks here are from the East Coast. Um, but racism in criminal justice and racism and racial disparities within military justice is a problem that transcends East Coast, West Coast. It's a national security issue, first and foremost. If individuals who have volunteered, the all-volunteer force went into effect in 1973, every single soldier, Coast Guards man or woman, airman or airwoman, Marine, uh, Naval personnel, they have volunteered to serve our country. They deserve the best military justice system, the most fair and efficient military justice system than they can get. That doesn't mean turning it into a civilian criminal justice system. It means trying to help uh, advance it to be the best it can be. Now, if that means uh, taking lessons learned from the civilian criminal justice system, so be it. If that means uh, advancing the ball even farther than the criminal justice system, so be it. So as Colonel Gunn just mentioned, the problem regarding diversity, equity, and inclusion, and the fair treatment of all individuals in the military, regardless of their skin color, regardless of their gender, regardless of their ethnicity, regardless of their sexual orientation, uh, is a much bigger issue than just military justice. But we're here than the military justice system. As Colonel Gunn mentioned, we had 167 African-American soldiers summarily discharged, administratively discharged. That means they were handled outside of the military justice system. Huge problem because it was racially motivated, obviously. Um, but I'm going to focus today on military justice system because that's what we've been asked to do. And for the military justice system today, just to set the stage, by that I mean the criminal justice system that was established by Congress under its Article 1, Section 8, Clause 14 authority to make rules governing and regulating the land and naval forces, which is everybody now, um, to deal with criminal offenses, as well as what's called non-judicial punishment, which is when a commander is judge, jury, and executioner uh, to, meet out, to meet out punishment a punitive consequence is often a career killer. Um, that also falls under what's called the Uniform Code of Military Justice, which is not just a penal code, but it's, a, it's, a, it's a, both a penal code that provides criminal offenses for the military, as well as numerous procedures governing the military justice system. So it's a different than, um, it's separate and distinct from federal criminal law. But again, racial disparities in the treatment of individuals in the military because of their race, and an eth eth ethnicity is, much, is a much broader issue. Um, and I'll go back to my first point. I think it's a national security issue because if, we, if individuals do not trust the system that they have volunteered to serve their lives in and potentially sacrifice their lives for, um, then, then in units are not, maximized, uh, are not maximized to their greatest potential. And I think we're gonna hear a lot about, from Colonel Shaw about that because he's written incredibly eloquently, poignantly and accurately about the, it, the ability to ensure everyone not only is treated fairly, but feels like they're treated fairly and is directly correlated to mission accomplishment. And therefore this is a national security issue. Okay, military justice, the problem, data and structure. So I just would like to outline the, the problem here. And, but first of all, I'd like to give a tip of my hat to civil society. So I worked in Ukraine um, in 2019, and I'm still working with the United States uh, uh, Agency for International Development regarding, um, regarding lawfare in, in Ukraine and in pushing back against Russian aggression there. But what was fascinating when I went to Ukraine is the huge role their civil society, these nonprofit organizations play, um, uh, civil groups play hand in hand and side by side with the government to help improve uh, help improve Ukraine and the lives of, of um, Ukraine, Ukrainian citizens. Here we have a group called Protect Our Defenders. But for Protect Our Defenders, we might not be talking about the very disturbing racial disparities in military justice today. What do I mean by that? 
In 2017, the nonprofit group Protect Our Defenders released a report after FOIAing Freedom of Information Act, pulling by tooth and nail um, uh, statistics from the various services regarding who's getting court-martialed, who's getting non-judicial punishment within the military, and is there a, is there a racial link uh, and ethnic link there? Their report broke two and a half decades of silence in which the Department of Defense had released no data on the treatment of service members of color in the, in the justice system. Um, despite knowing, as we've heard from Colonel Gunn, and we heard last week from folks like Professor Joshua Kassenberg, the fact that African Americans and other individuals of color in the military have been treated unfairly through disciplinary and military justice or criminal justice proceedings has not has been an open secret. It's known. It is known. It has been known, and yet the Department of Defense hadn't been doing anything for, about it for decades. At the end of the day, if you know that a system is producing racially disparate impact, at some point you have to take a step back and wonder. Is the system doing what it's designed to do? Does someone want it to be doing that? If we know about it, that it's been going along all along like this and no one's doing anything about it, then maybe some people are really happy with this result. I'll, I'll leave you, with, I'll keep, leave that thought in the background. So the protect, group Protect Our Defenders brought evidence of persistent black white disparities to the attention of Congress, Department of Defense and the nation six weeks after they released the report in 2017. Thanks to the, to the group Protect Our Defenders, Congress mandated a General Accountability Office investigation. The resulting report that was released in 2019, it's all public, publicly available, confirmed Protect Our Defending's findings with extensive research and analysis. I'm gonna review some of those findings. Yet the Department of Defense was still rather slow in the uptake. And therefore in 2020, 2020 Congress passed legislation that required the Department of Defense to transform how it monitors and addresses racial disparities for its service members. It updated that a bit in the 2021 National Defense Authorization Act. That legislation in 2020 was the, for the first time mandated transparency and oversight of racial disparities in the military. Well, Congress should have been doing this all along, right? So civilian control of the military, the bulk of that is not just having a civilian president. The bulk of that is the fact that you have Congress supposed to be providing oversight of the military and largely through power of the purse. So Congress is not off the hook here, but at least Congress has been doing something recently. So let's go back and see what actually has been going on here. So instead of diving into the Protect Our Defendants terrific report in 27, Protect Our Defenders report from 2017, let's look at the congressional report um, by the, uh, the, um, the apolitical um, nonpartisan um, watchdog group, the investigative body of Congress, which is the General Accountability Office. They found that Black service members were subjects of recorded investigations, that is, recorded investigations, investigations that were actually tracked because the military has a whole slew of different investigatory routes and capabilities, um, some with much less transparency than others, in order to investigate allegations of misconduct by service members. But black service members were subject of recorded investigations at a higher rate compared to their proportion of the overall service population. And that's in all military services, twice as likely, twice as likely. But if you're gonna be twice as likely investigated, you're probably gonna be twice as likely subject to various disciplinary consequences. And that's what the report found. Black, Hispanic, and male service members were more likely and are more likely to be tried in general and special courts martial in the Army, the Navy, the Marine Corps, and the Air Force. In three of the military services, it was twice as likely. That's how high. And all this is publicly available if you Google GAO report 2019. Black service members twice as likely as white service members to be tried in general and special courts martial. This is not new. This has been an ongoing problem for decades. Black and male service members were more likely than white and female service members to be tried in summary courts martial and to be the subjects of non-judicial punishment in the Air Force and the Marine Corps. The Army and the Navy didn't even com maintain complete data. The Coast Guard had too little summary court martial data and didn't maintain complete NJP data. The Department of Defense has taken some steps to study disparities. This is all from the GAO report, but has not comprehensively evaluated the causes of racial disparities in the military justice system. Now the asterisk is mine. Despite knowing that such disparities exist decade after decade after decade, I can give you a, a cause, and it's the same one of the same causes that that causes the racial disparities in in the criminal justice system in here in California, in New York, and across our great land. We have a problem with racism in our country being structurally embedded into the systems that run our country. Okay. 
The problem, though, is far deeper than these court martial numbers. I'd just like to highlight this. So in December of 2020, just a few months ago, this year has been flying by fast. So it's almost half a year ago now. Um, the Air Force re uh, uh, released an investigate inspector general report that confirmed everything the GAO said and actually kind of reveals that it's far worse. And this is something that piggybacks on what Colonel Gunn just mentioned. And that was the same thing in that 1972 um, DOD report on, it was uh, the, a task force on military and the administration of military justice found the same thing in the 70s. It's the same thing. Black service members voiced a consistent lack of confidence in Air Force discipline processes and de developmental opportunities compared to their white peers. Two out of every five black enlisted civilian officers do not trust their chain of command to address racism, bias, and unequal opportunities. One out of every three black service members said they believe the military discipline system is biased against them. Yeah, because they've got the facts to show it, objective evidence to show it. Three out of every five black service members believe they will not and do not receive the same benefit of the doubt as their white peers if they get in trouble. Ah, discretion. This brings up that huge discretionary pressure points in the structure of the military justice system that I'll talk, to it, talk about in a moment. When there is discretion to believe someone or not, Black service members do not get the benefit, the same benefit of the doubt that their white counterparts get. Boom, period, stop. Maybe if those decision makers are exercising such discretion, often with using just cognitive biases that all people have, if you're a human being, you have what's called cognitive bias. They have cognitive bias. If they're not being forced to record and report in order to provide a record of transparency, why they're making decisions, um, maybe that benefit of the doubt gets to creep in a heck of a lot more because of lack of accountability there. Let's go on. One out of every three black officers do not believe the Air Force and Space Force provides the same opportunities to advance as their white peers. Two out, out of every five black civilians have seen racial bias in the services promotion system. So this is wide ranging. This shows that this problem is much deeper than just looking at court martial, court martial numbers. There's a trust issue there. If there's a trust issue, there's a unit cohesion issue, there's a, there's a military accomplishment issue, there's a national security issue, and it's not new. So going on, measured rates per thousand, um, and this again is specifically Air Force, Black airmen are more likely to face disciplinary action than their white peers. Black service members were 74% more likely to receive Article 15s, 60% more likely to fake, face courts martial than white service members. Mm, pretty pretty stark disparities. Interestingly, over a 20 year period in the Air Force, rates of court martial and non-judicial punishment went down. We've had overall lessening of use of the formal mechanisms of military justice system because it's just easier for commanders to shun them to the side and say, Let them, let's admin discharge them. Less process, let's let less, uh, less issues there, right? And maybe a little less transparency because I would sure like to see where administrative discharge boards are going. I'd like to see the same transparency there. Anyway, courts martial and NJP went down, but the racial disparities stayed the same, stayed the same. And so hats off to the Air Force for at least examining their old reports and saying, yeah, we've known about this for a long time. Um, however, these studies and associated proposed recommendations often did not identify root causes, often did not compel follow through, often lacked mechanisms to measure effectiveness over time and broadly lacked accountability for progress. So what's going to be different today, Air Force? Let's hear it. What's going to be different from those 23 earlier reports? And let's go back to that. They did not identify root causes. I can identify the root cause. All of us sitting here can identify root causes. It's called racism that exists in our society. Okay, so let's stop beating around the bush and say we don't know what's happening. Racism does not mean an individual looks at another individual and says, oh, I don't like you because it club your skin. Racism can be much more nuanced and is much more nuanced when you deal with a structural, structural issues that have embedded racial, racial impulses within them, right? And so trying to identify those and limit those, identify when cognitive biases, cognitive biases, individuals are not aware that they are, that they are exercising. If we can identify the areas in which cognitive biases have their greatest impact, the military justice system hopefully can be tweaked. It's just tweaked, right? Because this is just one small part of the overall problem. Um, but we can we can advance the ball. We can advance the ball. So let's look at data. So today I wanted to look at the problem. Want to look a bit at data and then look at overall structure. 
and I'm at 14 minutes, so I'm going to make it pretty quick for the rest of this. This is another a quote from the, that GAO report. The GAO report found that there's a huge data collection issue here. There's a data collection issue here. We are, the military services are limited in which and, and how they're tracking how military justice system is being, uh, is being implemented. So if they're not tracking and seeing who, what's the race of the victim, what's the race of the accused, how do they know they even have a problem if they're not even looking at it, right? That sure means that they're not paying attention and, and kind of looks like they don't care. So let's track this better and do it in a consistent way. That's what the GAO office said. Um, well, the services were dragging their feet. DOD is dragging their feet. Granted, they had a lot going on, fighting several wars for a long time now. So Congress, rightly, as it should in its oversight role, stepped in. And the National Defense Authorization Act of 2020 mandated, took the GAO, GAO recommendations and said, look, services, you need to track and report to us race and ethnicity of victims and accused in all courts martial. They didn't require it for, for non-judicial punishment. They didn't require it for administrative separations or administrative actions. Hey, services, guess what? Here's an opportunity to say, you get it. You're going to do it on your own without being required to by law. Yeah, hope springs eternal. Let's see if they do. The NDA also required in law, the Secretary of Defense has to conduct an evaluation to identify the causes of any racial, ethnic, or gender, gender disparities, identify the military justice system, take steps to address the causes of any such disparities. The next, the subsequent NDAA required a comptroller general of the Department of Defense report to report on the 2019 GAO recommendations. The briefings were due to Congress by May 21st on the status of the report. I haven't seen anything. I'm wondering if Colonel Gunn probably has better situational awareness. Um, so when we'll go back to him, I'd love to hear about, have there been such briefings? Where are we with this people? Okay, last but not least, let's talk about structure for a moment and we can come back to this and I hope we sure will. Structural weaknesses require structural change. Structural weaknesses require structural change. So where do we have structural weaknesses within the military justice system such that uh, changes can be made to help remedy and ameliorate the disproportionate um, impact on, on racial minorities within the military? So there are significant amounts of non-transparent discretionary decision-making involved in military justice and disciplinary processes. Guess what? There is in the outside world too. In the civilian world and criminal justice system, the individuals that will be the most power are, are prosecutors. Because ever since in the 1980s, when um, states and the federal government went to uh, mandatory minimums uh, for sentencing, it's what the prosecutor charges and then what they decide not to charge, what they get away with and um, what they decide what to plea, um, to enter in, into a plea deal with or not. That governs how long someone's going to be going to be sitting in jail because of the mandatory minimums. Prosecutors wield a vast amount of power in the civilian sector, vast amount of unaccountable power. Many are elected in, this, in the state systems, but they're elected based on a completely opaque, almost completely opaque record. We know who they prosecute. We don't know who they didn't prosecute. We don't know why they didn't prosecute them. We don't know why they entered in a plea deal with one guy, but not the other guy. Yeah, there's a huge problem with transparency and lack thereof and discretion involved in the criminal justice system. So in the military justice system, you've got commanders who are non-lawyers and are pretty busy with other things deciding um, what to do with a particular report. And reports can come in all shapes and sizes of, of allegations of misconduct. Commanders wield vast amounts of unfettered and untracked discretion regarding um, investigations and what investigative modality to choose to respond to regarding an allegation of misconduct to, oh, I know that guy, Jim is great. He'd never do that to, oh my gosh, you better send this to one of our formal military criminal investigative organizations like OSI, CID, NCIS, and therefore launch a, a, a full-blown full -blown recorded investigation. That happens more for African-Americans than it does for whites because the whites get the benefit of the doubt. You can start to see the connection of the dots in these reports. The disposition decision, again, non-legally trained, non-independent, often biased military commanders making the disposition decision. Bias, what do I mean by bias? Not necessarily racially biased. Bias toward, they have conflicts of interest. Do I want my unit to be known as someone as having these huge sexual assault issues or can get, I get rid of this guy by just doing a discharge board? The disposition decision, whether or not on how to handle allegations of misconduct um, is largely an opaque one. And it's one that has a great deal of discretion, a great deal of discretion. I think that definitely needs to change. The same individual making the decision whether prosecute someone gets to pick the jury, 
that's just wrong. That's wrong on so many levels. It violates international human rights law. Um, it needs to change, plea bargain, et cetera. So some of the new tracking and reporting requirements will provide some forced transparency. I think it's completely insufficient. The, that forced transparency from the National Defense Authorization Act does not include tracking non-judicial punishment, does not include tracking investigations. Um, and what about the allegations? What, who tracks the allegations that are brushed aside, never, never are formally recorded? Um, what about providing justifications for all military justice disposition decisions, not just the ones that go to trial? And last but not least, let's take a hard look at transferring prosecutorial discretion from non-lawyer, non-independent commanders indebted to, embedded, uh, indebted to the chain of command to military lawyers independent from the chain of command, accompanied by disposition decision requirements, forced transparency, because just shifting the decision um, of, of what charges a prosecute and whom to prosecute from unaccount largely unaccountable commanders to military lawyers does not necessarily in and of itself solve the problem. However, it provides a greater belly button for greater accountability, first of all, and that transfer can be accompanied by greater requirements for transparency. Um, Patricia, thank you so much for your time. I tried to whip through all of that. That was a lot. I cannot wait to hear from Colonel Shaw and I'll leave it at that for right now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Van Landingham. So I'm gonna repeat the question one more time. Uh, Colonel Shaw, you are up. What can you share to educate our audience about the existence of disparity in the administration of military justice in the armed forces from a past, present or future perspective? Thank you so much, uh, Patricia. It's actually quite an honor uh, to be on this panel with uh, Will Gunn, who's one of my mentors and uh, really a giant uh, in, the, in the Air Force and military justice, and uh, Professor Lanningham, um, great presentation. Uh, so, so far you've heard uh, the history of the problem. Uh, you've heard uh, from the professor some legal and policy recommendations. And really what you're gonna hear from me uh, are what cultural modifications uh, need to be done and how lawyers can assist in uh, changing the culture. Uh, I, I'm going to reiterate something that Professor, or rather that uh, Colonel Dunn, uh, Gunn said earlier. Um, despite the injustices described, uh, there are still incredible opportunities in the armed forces for all Americans, including those who are underrepresented in our society. Uh, the other panelists, um, the moderator, and I are testimony of that, uh, the success that we've had in the military. Um, although all unfair treatment must be eradicated without a question, without a doubt. Um, I can also tell you that the military is not a bastion of racism and sexism. And often uh, when the issues are identified, uh, the perpetrators are held accountable. Uh, again, saying all that, uh, there's much uh, work to be done. Uh, Colonel, uh, Colonel Gunn did that work. Uh, uh, Rachel did that work and, and I'm doing that work uh, right now. So. Much like what uh, Colonel Gunn said, you know, the systemic racism and bias in the military justice system is really a symptom of the racism and bias that's within the United States uh, because the military is a subpart of, of our United States uh, society. Uh, removing and or mitigating bias is critical in order to make the military more effective. Our country is relatively diverse. And again, the military is a subpart is also diverse. Uh, removing bias will allow the military to harness its diversity, um, which is the competitive advantage that the United States actually has over its adversaries and our competitors. If we don't harness our diversity, our diversity will become a liability that adversaries will exploit, as we saw uh, in the 2016 election, and we also uh, saw it attempted in the, uh, the 2020 election. Uh, one of the challenges um, uh, that we have to move organizations uh, so that um, we can use our diversity to our advantage is that our leadership uh, often is not. So if you look at uh, law school professors, if you look at uh, senior officers in the, in, the, in the Marine Corps, if you look at Congress, um, if you look at uh, law firms, oftentimes uh, the organizations aren't diverse. And if we can uh, put up the slide uh, that I had, that'd be great right now, Patricia.
Okay, and if you can see from this slide, um, you know, where the U.S. population is, um, you know, red represents white, uh, white actually represents black here, uh, blue Hispanic, uh, yellow, ironically, Asian Pacific, and um, other is gray. Um, but when you get to the Marine Corps, you can see that the Marine Corps, again, is, is not as diverse as the U.S. population. Uh, but the challenge is, but, but it is still diverse. Uh, but the challenge is, is once you get to uh, Marine Corps GOs, that's Marine Corps general officers, uh, you can see that you know, not a lot of diversity there. And then when you get to uh, Marine Corps three and four star generals, and these are really the senior leaders that are running the Marine Corps, uh, there, there's, there's no diversity there. Um, updated for when this slide was produced, uh, there's, there's, um, there's one now African-American uh, three-star general. And in the history of the Marine Corps, um, well, there's been hundreds of, of uh, white uh, three and four-star generals, uh, there's been only seven, seven now. So that's, that's one of the challenges that we have as we try to work on issues of diversity and inclusion is that, um, that the leadership is not, is not diverse. So with that in mind, uh, when we look at these leaders, they oftentimes come in four buckets. Um, you know, bucket number one is that they are all in on DE&I and they want to, to be anti-racist, even if they don't know what that word means, uh, but they're all in, um, they're here to support. Uh, the second bucket is folks that know there's a problem, uh, but believe uh, it is being properly addressed. And they also believe that time will fix the challenges that we're having. The third bucket are folks that are simply fence sitters who are waiting to be convinced. And the fourth bucket are folks that know they are not biased and know there is no problem in the Marine Corps. Uh, clearly, I'm being facetious, but, but that's where they're at. Another challenge is ourselves. Um, all of us, uh, even those that are working hard in this space, um, hold biases. And those biases limit uh, what we see and what we don't see. Um, oftentimes, you know, a lot of what we're talking about right now are African-Americans um, and the challenges uh, with diversity and inclusion for African-Americans. Uh, but these issues affect Asians. These issues uh, affect Hispanics. They, they affect folks in the LGBTQ uh, community and they affect women. Um, I often think when I read the book Lean, Lean In, that if you replaced woman with black, uh, all the things that she was saying uh, resonated. Um, the other piece is that sometimes uh, we're more concerned with being right than actually convincing the organizations to move in the right direction. Um, as we all know, simply being right does not always get you to right. Uh, so really what I found um, in my work is that the way to mitigate bias and racism is to make organizations culture more inclusive. And over the past year, I've worked with a group of non-lawyer Marine leaders, uh, mainly colonels, uh, to help make the Marine Corps a more inclusive organization. So, you know, judge advocates and lawyers can help immensely in the DEI space, um, and these are the reasons why. Uh, some of the information that, that um, Professor Vandingham did not provide is that even though there was a greater opportunity uh, for African Americans and people of color uh, to be investigated, uh, and certainly a greater opportunity uh, for them to go to court martial, once they got to court martials uh, with lawyers present in the system, um, they were found guilty at the same rate as as other and got the same punishments as others. What that, sh what that shows is that when lawyers are in the system, uh, they help equalize the disparities uh, in the military justice system. Uh, beyond that system, um, lawyers have critical and analytical skills. Uh, we can issue spot quite well. We learned that all in law school. More than that, we can prioritize issues to attack. We can write well, uh, and we understand there are multiple perspectives on any issue. Finally, uh, we can be persuasive. Well, I guess we can be persuasive when we want to be. Uh, so the, let me tell you a little bit about the group that I led 
Uh, we called it the Diversity Inclusion Advisory Group for the Marine Corps. And this is what we learned. Um, this is how we started and how, what we learned. So first, uh, back in February, March of 2020, uh, the Marine Corps finally got around uh, to banning the Confederate flag. I know 150 years later, but we finally got around to doing it. Um, that was actually surprising to me because I, I just didn't think that we'd ever do it. When that occurred, I kind of scratched my head and I said, what else are we missing? Um, what else can we do in order to move the Marine Corps forward on issues of diversity and inclusion? So I began to talk to some of my peers, other African-American colonels uh, to kind of think through uh, what can we do to help the Marine Corps move on this. Uh, fast forward to, to May of 2020 uh, and Floyd, George Floyd was killed. And as a result of, of, of Floyd's killing, uh, the Commandant of the Marine Corps gave the Marine Corps uh, permission to talk about race. And that really opened the floodgates. So at that point, we formally uh, uh, got a group together of black male colonels. Uh, we started to meet each weekend to identify uh, what were the issues um, with the intention of providing our insights to Marine Corps leadership. Um, as we met for a couple of weeks, we uh, then found out, you know what, we need to expand the group to include black females. At first, the reason why it was only black males is that there's about 50 black male colonels in the Marine Corps. And there's, at that point, there was one black female. Um, and uh, we expanded the group to black female lieutenant colonels to get uh, black female perspectives in the group. I also canvassed a number of my mentees uh, to find out what's going on at the, at the deck plate level. Um, and uh, a number of them told me about the use of the N-word uh, and also other microaggressions that are actually happening in the fleet. Although we all felt that racism and bias was a problem, it really took us, um, again, African-American Marine senior leaders months to actually identify in tangible terms exactly what we thought the problem was. Through our problem framing, we identified the issue was creating inclusive climates, not necessarily creating more diversity. Again, a little bit more on that as I go down. Um, and there was lots of debate on how do you do that in the Marine Corps, which oftentimes is not a very welcoming environment. It's a harsh environment. Uh, as the saying goes, uh, we don't promise you a, gar a rose garden. So we saw that diversity, and I'll say little d diversity, is a strategic issue for the Marine Corps in a sense of the Marine Corps decides who they let in and who they don't let in. Uh, but creating inclusive environments is really the job of everybody, every leader, uh, to get the most out of their organization uh, and to convince leaders uh, to provide overwatch uh, to all Marines. So what is overwatch? Overwatch is a term that we use in the Marine Corps, a tactical term that we use in the Marine Corps, is that when Marines are going through a danger area, we'll have snipers uh, that are above them, or we'll have air assets, artillery assets that will protect them as they're going through this danger area. Uh, the challenge is that oftentimes, white leaders are not providing overwatch uh, to Marines that don't look like them. Uh, they will give the benefit of the doubt to Marines that look like them, other white males, uh, but sometimes or oftentimes they're not providing that same level of overwatch uh, to Marines of color, uh, Marines in the LGBTQ uh, community and, and women. After we kind of figured all this out and shared it with uh, some of our leaders, um, I wrote about it in a paper uh, called One Tribe Requires, Requires Inclusion and got feedback from many Marines uh, that said these are things that they were feeling throughout their career um, and it was tough to read, uh, but it was necessary to be said. After the paper, uh, our group got asked to develop the framework uh, for the Marine Corps uh, to develop their strategic plan. Uh, the Marine Corps accepted that framework and promulgated that uh, strategic plan on diversity, equity, and inclusion about a month ago. Um, in January, we expanded the DAG to include, we invited white officers, Hispanic officers, Asian officers, women, and also uh, Marines of different sexual orientations. One, uh, because we wanted to set the example, but two, uh, to get a, a deeper understanding of all the dynamics and perspectives involved. Um, the successes that we had um, is first, uh, we sought 
and obtained allies among leadership. Um, we got allies uh, from peer groups uh, that were friendly to the cause. And we also reached out to folks that were peers that weren't necessarily uh, friendly to the cause, at least to understand their perspective. Um, we operated within the organization. Uh, really, we were looking for evolution of the Marine Corps and not revolution of the Marine Corps. Kind of, if you kind of think of the, you know, do you reform police culture or do you defund the police? Um, and we're more along the lines of evolution, at least as we're talking about the Marine Corps. Um, and finally, we, we, we kind of figured out that you have to do both. Um, you have to change the law and policy uh, much uh, like the professor is talking about, but you also need to change culture because the culture uh, that leaders have is how they view the problem. And lawyers are actually good at both. Uh, lawyers, as lawyers, we need to be prepared to have the tough conversation with our leaders, our clients, and our peers, and our supporters to modify the culture uh, to ultimately make it more inclusive. So I'm gonna stop there and I am ready uh, for questions. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Wow. We could do this every day and still not touch the tip of all of the information that's, that's out there. So right now I'm going to stop for a moment and invite our audience to please put questions in the Q&A, which is next to the chat. I've already seen two hot questions. Put your questions in the Q&A and I am going to give a couple of announcements um, to, allow, to allow you time to do that. Oh, wait, wait, okay. And uh, then we'll go back to our panel. Thank you very much, panel, so, so far. Okay, let's see if I can go down, there we go. Want to invite you to get and stay involved. There are a number of things that you can do with the American Bar Association to get involved with our military and veterans. We invite you to visit the um, ABA Military and Veterans Legal Clinic, Legal Center at www.abamilvets.org to explore resources and opportunities. It brings in this um, location, they bring together the ABA entities, programs, and projects that are focused on legal services for military personnel, veterans, and their families. You can also find CLEs and webinars related to service members and veterans um, on ambar.org slash LAMP CLE. We ask you to consider our ABA military pro bono project. They are accepting, in this program, they accept referrals, um, case referrals from military legal assistance attorneys on behalf of our junior enlisted service members that are facing civil legal issues um, we need volunteer attorneys to help support them on a pro bono basis. The cases include family law matters, creditor and consumer issues, landlord tenant matters, and others. You can learn more by signing up on the link that is uh, on, the, uh, on this uh, slide, www.militaryprobono.org. The ABA also has free legal answers. We have a virtual legal advice clinic and on, the federal, on our federal site with ABA free legal answers for veterans, eligible veterans can submit questions about veteran federal legal issues such as discharge upgrades, VA disability and other VA benefit questions and get answers again from pro bono attorneys who have been accredited by the VA. The ABA also uh, provides a number of publications and you see here we have a, uh, a new book coming out called Military Discharge Upgrade Legal Practice Manual. It is available for pre-purchase or you can uh, order it on July the 7th when it is released. And then lastly but not least, join the ABA. The ABA membership is available to uh, all of the individuals that from law student to uh, senior uh, who have who have a desire to be uh, participate in um, a meaningful uh, programs for related to the law. Are you a member? 
Do you need to renew your membership? Go to www.americanbar.org slash membership. There are some programs for JAG officers who are in their first five years to get free, um, free, um, register, free membership. Um, so again, get and stay involved. And then we're gonna go back to our questions. Thank you again, panel, for that brief station break. Let's go to our first question. Okay. This person says, I'm curious why any panelist believes that changing the charging decision slash GC, GCMCA authority to an attorney would lead to a, any different outcome. In my experience, the OSJA is really making decisions regarding charging. The CG signature is on the referral but the power lies with the servicing SJA, Chief of Justice Trial Counsel. In my humble opinion, having a different set of attorneys make the decision will lead to greater number of prosecutions across all racial groups. So again, why would we make the charge change to the charging decision and anybody can answer? I'll jump in there because I think I was the first one that brought that issue up. First of all, it's about norm. It's normatively the right thing to do. We do not let non-medical commanders practice medicine, yet we let them practice law. Um, it's about trust. You saw those numbers that African American and other minority service members do not trust their chain of command to make right decisions in the criminal justice field. Um, we've also seen that across the board, with primarily with women, even though women are not the only ones that are sexually assaulted. You saw the Fort Hood report. Uh, the excellent report that Carrie Ritchie helped author. She was on this panel last week. Um, the lack of trust and confidence in the chain of command is stark. Um, but let's look at it. But the true answer is it's a structural one. It's not simply because they're a lawyer. It's a structural issue. First of all, you're not just switching from one lawyer to another. That's really dumbing it down. You're switching it from a staff judge advocate, you say a staff judge advocate who's already advising the commander. It's really their say. No, it's not. By law, it's not. By law, it's the convening authority who has the statutory authority to decide whom to prosecute and the statutory authority and for what charges and for, and they get to pick the panel members. So it's not the staff judge advocate. Second of all, that staff judge advocate does a million other things besides just criminal justice. They're advising their commander on a lot of other issues and they're not independent from the chain of command. That convening authority that they're advising, they work directly for. They have very vested interest in making that convening authority happy. It is a conflict of interest. It's very stark and clear, which is why most, the majority of our, of our the, the, the Commonwealth advanced industrialized nations have long divested their, their non-lawyer commanders of prosecutorial discretion. So it's about independence, an independent military lawyer, independent from that chain of command, independent from the unit, right? Independent from biases regarding potentially the victim or the accused, not independent of cognitive biases. That's where you get to the structural issue of 100% criminal justice. So the recommendation is to move prosecutorial decisions away from non-lawyer commanders, even though they're advised by advised by lawyers, they don't have to take their advice. And those lawyers they're advising are not free from, are not independent at all. And they're, they don't do military justice 100% of the time. Some of them have very little military justice experience in the course of their careers. So you, you move it to a prosecutorial um, office. I wish that would actually work for the service secretaries. I mean, I wish it would work for the secretary of defense because it should be joint. Why an individual in the army should be getting an NJP for for cocaine when the Air Force are going to court and they're going to get convicted and have a, you know, a, re a felony record for the rest of their lives is mind boggling for the same exact crime. We do not have purple justice. Goldwater Nichols left military justice by uniform code of military justice ain't uniform. It's a lot of work to do there. A lot of work. But if that independent pro this prosecutor who is doing 100 percent criminal justice decisions day in, day out, day in, day out accompanied by mandated transparency mechanisms. That is, they don't just get to make those decisions and they go away, no, they create a database. Why are you deciding to go to court on this? Why are you deciding not to go to a court on this? Why are you deciding to make this, this plea bargain? And, wh and, and why did you decide not to give the same guy who has a similar set of facts um, a, a different uh, plea bargain? So accompanying that uh, decision-making that's independent from the chain of command um, with greater uh, ethical guidance, like sufficient admissible evidence to convict should be mandated, 
right? It should just be an optional, non-binding advisory um, a guidance. It should be sufficient admissible evidence to convict, which is what most of the rest of the country follows, except for the military. Um, so I think the independence from the chain of command, the 100% focus on criminal justice, but it's that greater transparency. Transparency, because lawyers, just like commanders, have their own cognitive biases and are products of, of our society too. But by structurally focusing it, and taking it away from that chain of command and having greater transparency plus greater disp dispositional um, guidance regarding how to make those decisions, it simply makes sense. And I'll give you one example regarding what I mean by transparency and decision making. Here in LA County, Jackie Lacey, um, LA County has the largest DA's office in the country, district attorney's office in the country. Um, several years ago, Jackie Lacey, uh, who was our DA at the time, it created a practice of releasing a redacted report uh, 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 revealing the decision making that went into when officer related shootings would be whether they'd be prosecuted or not. Still, as with most of the country, the vast majority are not prosecuted, but the prosecutors themselves were were forced to write down and release to the public why they decided it why they decided to prosecute or not to prosecute with the hopes that that would force more rigorous decision-making in the process and provide transparency, greater transparency going forward. I think that should be for all felonies, all felonies. We should know why prosecutors are making those decisions, whether they're a commander or not. And I sure as heck hope they aren't going to be commanders for much longer. The change is eventually going to happen. And it should not just be for pink courts. It should not just be for sexual assaults. We don't want to create another double standard of special courts for primarily um, female victims, but a different court martial for the others. No, this is about an independence issue. These are structural defects designed into the military justice system that need to be fixed across the board for all serious of offenses carrying a year, more than a year of jail time, which is the felony, felony line. And I'll uh, cede to my wonderful panelists for, for the rest. Thank you. So, um, I, yeah, I have a few thoughts on that. Um, for, the, for the most part, I, I think the reality is it has to be training. Um, you know, if you move it to, to lawyers, uh, there, there's one Black Marine Colonel lawyer in the Marine Corps. Um, and I have stopped uh, certain... Um, prosecutions of um, folks that have looked like me because of insufficient evidence and um, because of just a wacky evidence. So I think moving it uh, to lawyers is not necessarily going to fix, fix the challenge. I think the reality, though, is, is to train folks to recognize their biases um, and to mitigate uh, for those biases. Uh, commanders have to make tons of decisions, life and death decisions, uh, who to put on the front lines, who to put in the, in, in the back lines, what uh, types of targets to take, uh, what types of targets not to take. Um, I think overall, we have to train those commanders uh, to be aware of their biases, uh, to remove their biases uh, so that it doesn't uh, poison um, the, um, the decisions that they're making. I do agree um, with Professor uh, Lanningham that there, there needs to be greater transparency However, I'd also just caution that um, even with transparency, uh, folks will put things into documents or dumb documents down. So you have the veneer of transparency and it's not actually uh, transparent. Um, and you know, right, wrong, and indifferent, if I were writing those documents personally or writing them for a commander, I'd write them in a way that um, uh, you know, no biases, even if there were biases, uh, were, were put in the document. Uh, that's just the nature of, of, of what we do. Over. From, from my perspective, I, I think uh, I agree with both of my colleagues that, uh, as Professor Van Landingham suggested, perhaps having lawyers and prosecutors more involved in the process or having accountability shift there, there may be some advantage with respect to that. I certainly believe I agree with Colonel Shaw in terms of the importance of, of training and recognition of biases and that everyone has them and just being a conscious of the ones that individuals have. But I believe that uh, the, the greatest elixir here may be one of accountability and accountability starts with measuring, uh, measuring the problem and you really have to measure the problem and you, from the smallest offenses all, all the way up. 
uh, it was uh, it was it was my experience in the military that discharges in, ended up in a certain way, and certainly minor offense court martials were the result of people that had climbed the disciplinary ladder, and that uh, they'd been in trouble before, and uh, and you had uh, commanders, you had uh, people in that supervisory chain that felt or expressed an, a, a, dis, an, a conclusion that they'd done all they could do and they had no choice but to take a, a more se severe action. And, and again, uh, you know, I, I don't, I am, uh, I'm mixing the, the two. I know that there's an administrative system and there's also the court martial system. And while we're focused primarily on that uh, military justice system, they, they are, they're aligned in terms of real life consequences on individuals. When an individual leaves the military with bad paper, a bad discharge, be it a bad conduct discharge, dishonorable discharge, discharge under honorable, dis, other, other than honorable conditions, or even a discharge, a general discharge under honorable conditions as a result of an administrative discharge, those all have, uh, in many cases, lifelong consequences. So we have to be, uh, we have to focus on those. A lot of problems in the system are invisible. They're, they're invisible because they're not, they're not measured uh, right now. But I think that to the extent that you measure from the smallest offense all the way to the greatest offense, you have a, a greater potential for bringing reform in, in, into the system. And I see in the chat box, there is a link to a Military Times uh, article um, that can give you some more on what are we asking for with the military justice reform. Okay, so we have another question in chat. Um, do the panelists have any suggestions as to anything civilians can do to improve the racial situation in military justice? If, if, I, if I can uh, re respond, uh, I'll respond first this time. One of my favorite quotes that, I, that I'm reminded of in this context comes from Frederick Douglass. And it's attributed to him. And he said that power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. And that's, in, in this context, it's a question of pressure. Asking questions, demanding reforms. I saw something else in the, in the, uh, in, in the uh, I think it was a chat or Q&A box, where someone said that the fact that data doesn't exist that that was intentional. Well, whoever wrote that is absolutely right, that uh, there were people in, in different services. I think my, my former service did a better job of, of uh, capturing at least some of the data with respect to non-judicial punishment and courts martial, but there's a lot of data that, that is missing and is not available and in the past was not captured in the same way. So to the extent that civilians place pressure on the system, the system will change. The system does respond. A few years ago, Senator Gillibrand of New York wasn't receiving very much attention at all when it came to calls for reform with respect to uh, sexual assault cases. But she's receiving far more attention today because more people, it's not just her, there are more people that are demanding reform. So civilians, what can you do? Place pressure on the system. Okay, no one else, I'll move on to the next question. Okay, it's a, it's a, it's a little bit of a, a intro to it. This person is also seems to be a historian. Thanks for an informative discussion. The stats are startling and upsetting, but not surprising. America has a long history of not recognizing or recognizing Blacks and people of color many, many years after the event, despite the fact that the Blacks have served in every war. Crispus Attucks of African and Native American descent was the first person killed in the American Revolution. 
Despite the stupendous achievements of the Tuskegee Airmen during World War II, it took more than 60 years before they were awarded the Congressional Medal. Additionally, without the code breakers in the World War I and World War II, what might have been America's fate? Yet it was not until 2008 that they were formally recognized, at which time many of the outstanding men were deceased. What can we civilians and citizens do to change the situation to get the recognition in time with the activity is what uh, the action of valor is what I believe she's asking. Anybody? I, I'd, I'd go back to what uh, Colonel Gunn said with the first uh, question. I mean, certainly uh, informing your uh, your representatives uh, to do it, and and also um, there, there's lots of, of military organizations locally. Uh, that you can press them to uh, recognize uh, different different types of folks. So when I was stationed in Hawaii, uh, there was a woman that created an organization that recognized the African Americans that served as uh, Steve Droves, uh, folks that were loading ammunition on um, on Navy ships uh, during during World War II. And again, just a great organization and taught me a lot about uh, what happened in, in World War II. In uh, in Hawaii um, that I that I they otherwise wouldn't have known, and she was a civilian, no connection uh, to the military at all. So um, there's lots of stories out there, and, and you can help um, help showcase uh, th those stories of that history. And I just add, as uh, just now working for the Vietnam Veterans of America, supporting our veteran organizations because they are, as uh, Colonel Shaw just said, they are they are recognizing individuals who've been forgotten, but they all do it by donations, uh, contributions uh, from our um, civilians and our uh, citizens to make sure that they can do these programs and awards. So support our, our veterans organizations. And the, I, I have one as well, and I'm, I'm just putting it in the chat box. I linked to the report. So uh, the NAACP's chapter in Houston, along with the National Institute of Military Justice, of which I am part of, and uh, South Texas College of Law did a deep dive into the Logan um, travesty of justice and, and uh, formulated a clemency petition um, for those soldiers that were, that were unjustly prosecuted. Um, interestingly, they brought the clemency petition all the way to the, to the, to the TJAG of the Army who said, oh, but that was just the military justice system at the time, so I can't do anything. Well, the military justice system at the time was severely broken. It wasn't just that the two biggest mass trials were held in military justice history. These men were referred to by racial epithets in the middle of their trial. There was gross procedural irregularities. I don't care if any of these folks are factually guilty. We let factually guilty people go free all the time because the constable has blundered. Right. And that's because if there isn't due process in the system along the way, we don't trust the results. And we have that for purposes of due process and fundamental fairness. So there is a clemency petition. And I sure as heck hope the new secretary of the Army will see um, a lot more clearly than the current TJAC of the Army and actually um, push for this clemency petition. That's something you can send to your representatives. If I, if I could add, add one one thing, and, and I think that's a, a great point that uh uh, Professor Van Landingham just just made uh, another thing that uh, civilians can do is so celebrate the history that they that they know about. And how how do you learn about how do you learn about that history? There are various ways. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting for for me. I attended the Air Force Academy, but it wasn't until my junior year at the Air Force Academy in 1979 that I ever heard the term Tuskegee Airmen. Now. Uh, I, I just found out why that was just a, a year or less than a year ago. And the reason was that the organization, uh, Tuskegee Airmen Incorporated, had just been established around 1978, I believe. And so it was not a term in and of itself that had been used in the past. And I hadn't heard the story of Black aviators in World War II until I heard the story under the heading of the Tuskegee Airmen. And once that organization, Tuskegee Airmen Incorporated, was established, then what has happened in the succeeding 40, uh, 42 years has been phenomenal in terms of getting the word out. 
there's been a, a movie, there has been all kinds of stories, recognition, uh, there, <laughs> there's been the Congressional Gold Medal. And, and, though, and that's great because people started to tell the story. There was an organization there. There's an organization that I would uh, like to bring to everyone's attention. Uh, uh, Colonel Harris mentioned it uh, when she introduced me, and that is the History Makers. There's an organization, uh, the hist I've served on the Military Advisory Committee for the History Makers for the last year, and they have a phenomenal archive of African-American audiovisual histories where they interview living folks uh, in various wa walks of life and catalog that and their, their catalog is on file uh, at the Library of Congress, but also in many colleges and universities around, around the country. And they're available online where you can find out a lot of diff different information. So my, my tip, my suggestion is tell, tell the stories that you know about. The first, one of the first military histories, black military uh, uh, history heroes that I heard about was Dory Miller, a, a uh, cook on board a ship that was docked in Pearl Harbor during World War, uh, at the beginning of World War II on December 7th, 1941. Well, Dory Miller's story wasn't told uh, until the word leaked out. And uh, when word leaked out through black newspapers and such that a, a black man who wasn't trained as such had been a hero in shooting down planes and, and uh, engaged in various heroic acts, then he, he got recognition. Even with that though, because of the times, he ended up with the Navy Cross as opposed to the, uh, as, as opposed to the uh, Medal, Medal of Honor, despite uh, incredible exploits on that day. Thank you very much. Colonel Shaw, this next question is for you. It says, would you be willing to share more about the framework or strategy your team developed on the best way forward? They agree that cultural, uh, cultural change is foundational as culture bleeds into everything in all actions. How do you frame promotion of an inclusive environment and deal with the social experiment naysayers? Bucket four, folks. <laughs> okay, thanks for the question, uh, Ms. Davis. Um, you know, pl please read my paper because uh, I, I talk about it. Um, again, uh, one tribe requires inclusion, uh, but I'll talk about the framework. Uh, the framework that we used uh, called for four lines of effort. Um, the first line of effort was recruiting. The second line of effort was talent management. The third line of effort was uh, training and education. And the fourth line of, of effort was commandership. Now, I think what's important about that is that that lines up with how the Marine Corps views most of its problems. They see them as recruiting problems, talent management program problems, education and training problems, and commandership. So we, we look at the problem of, of racism, bias, diversity and inclusion, and then we try to frame it in the lens uh, that the Marine Corps responds uh, to issues. Another issue is that um, we put them in buckets uh, where uh, there are folks that are responsible for those issues. So in a sense of that recruiting, we have a recruiting command. Uh, uh, talent management, uh, we have um, Marine Corps uh, re uh, manpower and reserve affairs. Education and training is run by my general uh, training and education command. And commanders, everything in the Marine Corps is very uh, commander focused. So, so I think, again, when we look at these things, we want to shape the response in the way the organization normally uh, responds to other issues. Again, not revolutionary. I think you want it to be evolutionary. Uh, the other issue with the naysayers, um, how do I say it? Uh, there are some folks that are, are, are racist and you're never going to convince them. Um, there are others, I'd say, that are on the, on the fence. And I think the way you do that um, is that you have to talk to them. You have to talk to them in an environment um, where uh, they can actually truly share what they think and what they feel. And when that, when that happens, 
then you actually understand where they're coming from. Um, you, it has to be, I mean, I did a lot of the, uh, the anti-extremism extremism training um, and like sitting down and really hearing how people feel um, and, and doing it in a way where they can reveal themselves uh, then allows you uh, to respond to that. After you talk to certain people, to, to people, you'll get a, get a sense of where they're, they're coming at. Um, they believe they don't want to uh, lower standards and then you can talk to how we're not lowering standards. And what is the actual standard? Is there a standard? Um, you can find out if it's, um, you know, really what their issues are. But then you can develop training to uh, modify the behavior in a way uh, that's responsive to them. And then finally, uh, what we found is that particularly for the commanders, a lot of Marine commanders, again, the majority of them are white males. Um, and these are issues that they, I'm not gonna say they don't care about, but they're just not aware of. Um, and so you have to provide tools that they can use in their own words to kind of develop their situational awareness uh, so that they can be stronger. And I'm just gonna, I'm gonna leave you with this in the sense of that um, what's going on in Palestine, Palestine um, it's tough. It's horrible when you look at the pictures. Um, I, don't, I don't know all the history of it. I don't know all the politics of it. And I, I don't care. Um, and again, as a human being, I should care about it, but it's, it's not in my, it's, it's not in my day to day. So though I, I see it on TV, it's not something that I'm not sending money to anybody. I'm not trying to change that situation in Palestine. I use that not to be, not to be caustic, but in the sense that I think a lot of white commanders, it's not their issue. It should be their issue. It needs to become their issue, but it's not their issue. Um, and if it's not their issue, they're not concerned about it. So um, again, I share that. Um, and, and on the other side, there are some white commanders that it, that it is their issue um, and, and they act accordingly. So um, I think the, the question is, you gotta meet people where they're at, you gotta talk to them, you gotta train them, uh, and then you have to actually give useful tools for them to attack, attack the issues at bay. Over. Okay, I, I'm trying to track our questions here. They seem to have moved. Uh, <laughs> there was a question that Professor Van Landingham answered, but I'm going to also ask it to the rest of the panel. We have well supported evidence that we have a diversity, equity, equality, excuse me, representation issue. Are we trending in the right direction? Are we stagnant? Even if we're moving at a glacially slow pace, do you feel that focusing on a more diverse leadership? within the ranks would have the effect of lessening some of the disparity we experience in charging actions and promotions, command opportunities, school selections. Um, so that's the question. And I'm sorry, I was trying to answer a different question. So as a oh, person okay. answering in there, so I wasn't answering that one. <laughs> okay. And I'll go over to Colonel, Colonel Shaw for that one. But I also think it is something just like um, with juries uh, compositions in the, in the civilian criminal justice system, um, you know, it, there's, there's quite a bit of, of strong evidence that show that more diverse and representative juries, um, produce more fair and just results. Um, and so I'd love to hear Colonel Shaw's thoughts on, on uh, greater diversity. I, I do, I do want to share though, Colonel Shaw showed a great slide, um, for the Marine Corps and, uh, the diversity at the very, very top or lack thereof. So this is, I'd had in my slide deck that I had. Um, I had a hidden, here's diversity across all the armed services um, from 2018 of race and ethnicity by rank. Um, and so you can see that general and flag officers across all the services have the, the least amount of, um, of, uh, of diverse representation. So, so over to you, Colonel Shaw. So that, that question is from one of my mentees. So uh, thanks for uh, trying to, uh, I guess, thump the chop. There, uh, Tracy Holt, really. um, and I didn't so, realize we had time, so make it a short. <laughs> okay, I'll make it quick. I, I think I think it, it still goes to training. So um, you know, I was all my teachers or, or the vast majority of my teachers were white males. Um, I'm an academy grad, um, and even at law school. Um, and so there there are biases that I have as well. Uh, when I was looking at, at, at chart sheets as a young prosecutor, uh, without like having the the defendant in front of me. You know, oftentimes I saw a black, a black Marine, 
Um, and it was only when I'd come into court that I'd see that, uh, wow, a white dude did that. That's incredible. Um, so, so I've grown from that without a question. Um, so I, I say, I, I don't think the answer is simply diversity for diversity's sake. I think the diversity does help. Um, but I think the, the reality is, is that we have to move towards education, understanding the biases, uh, because again, there's a number of, of black officers, um, that are, that are negatively hooking up, um, their African-American Marines, um, uh, because they see the, they see the issue the same way their white counterpart, uh, does because they went to school, they went to school. They had the same, they're from upper class, uh, middle, upper class, uh, backgrounds and they see the issues the same way. Uh, so we just have to be, I don't think that that necessarily solves it. And, and we have to be very careful. Uh, I think oftentimes the Marine Corps at least has said the way we're going to solve this problem is we're going to recruit our way out of it. Um, and they try to recruit, they don't change the culture. And then those folks that they recruit then leave the Marine Corps uh, because they don't like the environment. So we have to change the environment to make it more inclusive, which will, will help our, our, our recruiting and will help make our, our processes ultimately better. Thank you. Colonel Gunn, 30 seconds. I, I, I think that we are trending in the right uh, direction. Anything. Sorry. Summing up anything, anything you want to say in 30 seconds. <laughs> yes. And, and, I, and I'll respond to that question. I think that we are trending in the right direction overall but it does take training. I, I worked with the ABA, I chair of the Commission on Racial and Ethnic Diversity in the legal profession. And, and looking there, I came across a study that said that it, it, one of the sub points was that in those uh, situations in which people were saying, people in leadership were saying, I don't see race and, and statements along those lines, that those were often the most problematic uh, situations because they fail to acknowledge that people are different. They fail to acknowledge the possibilities that biases ex existed. And I think that it does take training and we have, we have to emphasize that as well. Okay. Thank you very much. Training and structure, structural changes as well. We need it all. <laughs> Absolutely. It, a holistic you. problem Thank takes holistic solutions. <laughs> There is a lot of information on the ABA. There are some other panels, the panel from last week. Look at the information that the ABA offers. Join, support your veterans, support your military, support, uh, make, make your voice known and make it be something that you are contributing positively towards this discussion. We thank you again, everyone on the panel. You did an excellent job. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, attendees. And, and there are, it will be a video uh, about, this video will be shared with you. So thank you again, everyone. That's all, good. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you, ABA. And thank, thank you, Mary. Yes. Mary and Allie for your- <laughs>